Hi, my name is Andrew Meese. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Six Meridian. Thank you for joining us today as we talk about 2019 and what the outlook is for 2020. 2019, 2020 outlook, and then we're going to talk about risks for what we're looking at in 2020, what things we're concerned about, and then we're going to talk about what opportunities we're seeing for client portfolios. 2019, to talk about what happened in 2019, you really have to go back and look at what happened in 2018. Um, the second half of 2018 was a large driver for the returns that we saw in 2019. And so we're going to go through and we're going to go through a flow chart of what happened to lead to the, the strong returns we saw in 2019. So the first thing that happened is in 2018, we saw uh, growth metrics, things that investors look at, start to deteriorate. Specifically, the PMIs, um, which this is a purchasing manager index, and it looks at economic activity from the manufacturing sector. And if we took this chart back further, you would see that it was pretty well flat coming into the summer of 2018. And in the summer of 2018, we started to see a decline, and this was put the market on notice that there could be an event coming or, or a slowdown, an economic slowdown. This took place at the same time that the Fed was in the process of raising interest rates. And then the final thing that happened in the summer of 2018 is we had an in inversion of the yield curve. And an in inversion means that short-term interest rates were higher than long-term interest rates. And historically, this has been an indicator, um, not always a great indicator and sometimes with a long lead time, but it is an indicator of economic slowdown and a potential recession. And so when you put those three things together, you started to see investors get very nervous about the outlook. This is uh, talking specifically about the Fed and what took place in the fourth quarter of 2018. Um, in October of 18, Chair Chairman Powell, and this is when the S&P 500 was just above 2,900, Chairman Powell said, uh, we are a long way from neutral at this point. And at that point, the Fed funds rate was 2.18%. Then when we come into November, late November, you'll see the S&P had sold off. We continued to have the slowdown in the indicators that we track. And Powell at that point says, we're just below the range of estimates of what neutral would be. And even though the rates are the same, what he, had, what he was talking about during that period of time is that the economic data had weakened and the stock market had sold off pretty significantly. Uh, at that time, it was still expected that the Fed was going to hike rates one more time in December. Um, President Trump started uh, to put out tweets saying that he thought it was a mistake, and the market as a whole started to say that they were concerned about this taking place. They went ahead and did do the rate hike in December, and what you saw was a very significant sell-off. In the fourth quarter of 2018, the market was down 13.5%, which was the worst fourth quarter we've had since 2008. It was actually one of the worst quarters we've had since 2008. In January, Powell, seeing that this was all, uh, that the market was reacting very negatively, he came out and said, uh, we will be patient. And that was the signal that the market took from that day, January 4th, to the end of the year, the stock market rallied 30%. So we see the growth disappointment, we see the Fed then start to react, give the market a sense that they were going to do something. And this is just a chart of the Fed funds target rate. Um, and what you see here is the 2018, the hikes that took place, we leveled off after they said that they would be patient. And then starting late 2019, the Fed actually started cutting interest rates. This provided a lot of fuel for investors and for the, uh, for the stock market and for the economy. And then the final thing that the Fed did, um, this tracks, this graphic tracks the change in the size of the Fed's balance sheet. And if you remember five years ago, six years ago, the Fed was engaging in something called quantitative easing, and that meant that they were buying treasury bonds and holding them on their balance sheet. Um, that stopped by January of 2016, and the balance sheet was pretty flat during that entire period of time. But then in early 18, they started to shrink the size of the balance sheet. And that, in effect, acts as a tightening mechanism. It tightens financial conditions. And that, in connect connection with the Fed hiking interest rates, um, led to probably some of the sell-off we saw in the fourth quarter of 2018. Earlier this year, the Fed actually started expanding their balance sheet again. And with that, the result was the fourth quarter of 2019, we had a significant rally. The timing coincides very closely to what happened to the balance sheet. So we now see the Fed easing and then the financial asset response. So this is what drove the returns. The first thing we're going to look at is the S&P 500. 
And what this chart shows is the forward PE ratio. So the price to earnings ratio for a stock is the price and divided by the earnings. So if you have a $10 share price and that company has $1, $1 of earnings, then you have a PE of 10. What this shows is what the forward PE has been since the financial crisis. And then you'll see this coincides exactly with what happened in 2019. The forward price to earnings ratio expanded dramatically. And in fact, today we're at the highest level that we've had um, since the financial crisis. This is going to be an important point for us. To, we're going to talk about that in a, in a few minutes in a few slides. It's very important that the S&P 500 earnings in 2020 start to deliver and start to expand because the PE multiple probably has done all it can do uh, to drive returns. And then the last piece of uh, economic response that we saw from the Fed's actions was in the yield on U.S. 10-year treasuries. And they, in late 2018, they got as high as 3%. And then by this summer, they were down to 1.5%. So they were cut in half the yield on the 10-year. That impacted mortgage rates. That impacted the value of municipal bonds, corporate bonds, and drove very strong returns for fixed income investors. Um, going back to the, the price earnings ratio expanding point one more time, or to, to actually um, talk more about it in terms of what it did, in 2019, the S&P 500 had a total return uh, on a price basis, excluding dividends, of 29.1%. This bar chart here shows you breaking down the components of that return into how much of it was from the PE multiple expanding and how much of it was from earnings growing. And what you see here is that earnings actually were slightly negative over this time period. And all of the return was simply because investors paid more per dollar of earnings than they did previously. And for comparison, what we look at here is since 2009, you see the total return for the S&P 500 was 12% in total. And of that 12%, 9.7 came from earnings growth and 2.3% came from multiple expansion. If I showed you this chart for the last 50 years, what you would see is that the portion of return from multiple expansion typically is very small. It's almost always, and, and you would expect this as an investor, your, your earnings or your growth comes from earnings growth. That's how you make money as an investor. So what we need to see is that in 2020, I can almost guarantee you that this bar will not look the same. It's going to have to look like it has much more orange in it, and maybe the brown actually has a little bit of a negative color to it as well. Okay, so then the historic rally from that response, uh, we've highlighted here 2019, uh, broken into stocks, bonds, and commodities, and everything was up in 2019. And the point to look at is then in 2019 how good it was, how 2018 was, was particularly bad for some asset classes. Um, the S&P was only down 4.4, but emerging market was down close to 15% for the year. So what I've been telling clients and telling investors is you really need to look at 2018 and 2019 as a combined event because the negative returns in 18 were probably overstated and the positive returns in 2019 were probably overstated. The combined gives you a better sense of what you earned over that two-year period of time. The result of this historic rally is we have a very expensive stock market. This chart from Goldman Sachs shows us the, uh, a number of different measures that track how expensive the market is. We have price to earnings on here, forward PE ratio. We have um, enterprise value to sales. So a variety of different measures. And then we look at how those compare to history. Uh, so relative to historical values, where do we sit today? And what you'll see on the index level is that it's pretty consistent that we are at extreme levels of valuation. It doesn't mean the stock market has to crash. It doesn't mean the stock market has to go down. What it means is that the economic data has to catch up with the move that we've seen in prices. And then if you look at the median metric, we're anywhere from the 90th to the 99th percentile of valuation. One addendum I would add to that is we're talking about how everything has gotten very expensive. The one caveat to that is there is one pocket of the market that is still somewhat cheap and certainly cheap relative to other assets available to you, and that's value stocks. And this is just looking at um, how value stocks uh, PE compares to the market as a whole. Uh, we went back and looked at the data. For the last 15 years, value stocks currently are two standard deviations cheap, which two standard deviations cheap is typically a time where if you buy it, you're going to do reasonably well on a go for basis. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. 2020 outlook. Uh, I've had a lot of questions from investors. What do I expect for 2020? 
the first thing, we don't make forecasts because we have no idea what's going to happen on a go forward basis. But I can tell you there are conditions that are present that encourage or, or discourage you uh, making money as an investor. And we think 2020 has four things in place that lead us to believe we probably will make money in 2020. The first is global central banks on hold. The uh, ability for investors to make money is greatly enhanced if interest rates aren't rising. It's very difficult for stocks to go up. It's very difficult for bond prices clearly don't go up if uh, interest rates are rising. In 2020, we should see global central banks on hold. Uh, the trade and Brexit situation is much better than it was a year or 18 months ago. The phase one trade deal with China should be beneficial and the Brexit uh, situation has cleared up. It's pretty clear that they're going to exit the European Trade Union sometime in the next 12 months and those probably aren't going to be the headwinds that they had been in the past. So that's a little bit of a benefit. The global economy is improving. The, there's clearly a trend that global manufacturing, global demand is improving compared to where it was last year. Uh, we need earnings to follow and hopefully that, that those trends, I'm gonna show you a slide in a minute. We don't anticipate significant or, or breakout growth for the economy, but as long as it is growing and as long as the trends are improving, we think that that helps investors. And then finally, the presidential election in 2020. Most of you hopefully are aware that we are having an election in 2020. And I'm gonna show you some data on what the markets are right now saying they think is likely to happen. But the fourth year of a presidential cycle typically is a positive return for investors. The presidential cycle is the first year of a presidential term, you typically make money. The second year, you oftentimes lose money. Third year is typically up significantly. And the fourth year is up modestly. If this year we are up, President, President Trump's cycle will exactly follow that trend. Okay, talking about yield, um, I had mentioned before central banks are on hold. One of the things that we hear, uh, you hear from President Trump, you hear from others, that it seems ridiculous that the United States has higher interest rates than the rest of the world. And at, on its face, that makes sense, that concern or that, that issue. Here we show what's called nominal 10-year yields. And so we've got Italy, United States, Japan. And, and what you see is there's a pretty big, get, pretty big difference between what the United States pays to borrow money compared to, for example, uh, France, which pays nothing. It's, it costs them nothing to borrow money. But this interest rate doesn't tell the full picture. What you really have to look at is what are the, what's the inflation situation and what's the growth situation in the economy when you're looking at the interest rate. So if we look at this column, you'll see the, what we call the real yield, which is the nominal yield minus inflation. And when you do that, you see a picture where maybe the discrepancies aren't quite so large. So we'll look at the United States, the real yield is negative 34 basis points. Um, and that's pretty similar to Japan, the United Kingdom. Those are pretty similar. Italy actually has, still has a positive real yield. Um, France and Germany are big outliers, and that's primarily because the ECB is such a large buyer of European bonds that it's driven those yields to what we think are uncompetitive levels, and, and it's very puzzling why you would want to own a German 10-year um, or a, France, a French 10-year bond at this point. The only place where you can get positive real yield is in China, which has a 1.7%. In 2019, you may have recalled uh, the issue of negative yielding debt. And this became, a, you can see here, this is the, uh, the dollar value of assets that had negative yields. So in essence, I buy a bond for $100 and I'm gonna get less than $100 when it matures. It seems ridiculous and it seems kind of preposterous. And it was a little bit of a, uh, an issue going back to uh, late 18, early 19, 2019. But as we had some growth fears and we had some flight to quality, you saw a massive increase in the amount of debt that traded at negative yields. It hit $16 trillion. And it's come down pretty significantly since then. I wouldn't be surprised if 10, 15 years from now we look back and this is an anomaly that hopefully doesn't continue because I don't think there's a good economic case for it, but it could be an anomaly similar to what we saw in the early 80s when US treasuries you could buy and they would yield 12, 13, 14%. People look at that and, and in hindsight see that that was a great buying opportunity for you as a fixed income investor. So the GDP outlook I talked about before that it's important that we see good GDP, GDP growth in 2020 and we do anticipate GDP growth globally improving. In the US, we actually think it's gonna be more of the same. Um, this is a consensus from about 50 different analysts right now. There's a 1.8% expected growth rate. That number is very similar, remarkably similar to what we've seen over the last 10 years. 
Uh, the GDP growth has averaged 2.2% since the financial crisis. Our best guess is 2020 will look very similar to what we've seen the previous 10 years. And on a go forward basis, it probably seems pretty stable as well. One question I've gotten from clients is why didn't the tax uh, cuts have a bigger impact on GDP growth? And I think that the big issue with the tax cuts, the timing of the tax cuts offset probably some of the drag we saw from the trade war. And so growth likely would have been higher, likely would have been better if we wouldn't have had the trade war that we were going through. So for 2020 and beyond, let's talk about some of the risks that we're looking at and some of the things we're concerned about. One is I just talked about the economy. We anticipate it looking very similar to what we saw the last 10 years. If that changed, then the Fed might not be on hold. If we saw inflation start to pick up, if we saw economic growth start to pick up, then the Fed might be back on with rate hikes. We saw how big of an impact the Fed rate cuts had on asset values. It could go the other direction if they had to start hiking rates. Uh, if earnings growth fails to materialize, we've seen that the return from the S&P 500 was, was driven almost entirely by multiple expansion. If we don't see earnings come through, it's going to be very difficult for the market to make further advances because the earnings won't be there to support it. A uh, big progressive electoral victory. This is primarily focused on the presidential election. Um, we'll talk about Sanders and Warren here in just a minute. Uh, but it could also um, uh, have an impact as you look at Congress and you look at or the House and in the Senate. So that's something to watch. Uh, geopolitical, Iran, North Korea, I think that every presentation that we do, we, we have to throw a comment like this in there. The reality is we have a very recent uh, data point about Middle East geopolitical risk and it just it didn't that the dog didn't bark so to speak so we're going to talk about why that is North Korea is still the outlier because they have some very dangerous weapons located in a heavily populated area that's crucial to global supply chains and then the trade war back on we would not want to see that and um, we'll show you a slide on how that clearly had a negative impact to global GDP and it would be a risk that we would be watching for if that bubbled up again so let's go into some of the data. This is uh, about earnings, talking about how crucial it is that earnings start to come through in 2020. This red circle shows you the earnings, the, re the reported earnings for the last four quarters. And what you see is, if you saw this chart, and I didn't tell you how much a return you made as a stock market investor, I don't think you would have guessed that the market was up 30% last year, given this was the earnings picture. But what happened is this, earnings picture was anticipated in 2017. And if you remember in 2017, uh, we had very poor returns from the equity market. 28, or in 2018, excuse me. In 2019, we saw strong returns because we were anticipating the earnings growth likely to come through in 2020. So what we need is we need for that to come through and to deliver. Here are the earnings estimates for the next 12 months for a couple of different markets. The first is for the United States S&P 500 up 15%, Europe up 35%. I can tell you before we go through this, none of these numbers are going to be hit. They, these are all wildly optimistic. But nonetheless, directionally, what we see is, is a positive improvement. Um, one that we're tracking closely is Korea. The Korean market is heavily export uh, dependent and it is a very good leading indicator about global growth. And so what we're seeing is pretty high expectations for earnings growth coming out of that market. We'll see if that actually happens. Um, in the U.S., I think that this is likely to be cut in half in terms of the go-forward estimate for earnings. Uh, but even a 7.5% earnings would allow for the market to probably make a little bit of forward progress. Okay, the, uh, the, the fun uh, conversation for 2020, who's going to be the next president of the United States. This is uh, data, and I updated this an hour before we recorded this, because if I would have shown you the slide in here three hours ago, it had already changed. And this is from a uh, website called Predict It. And what they do is they take wagers on who's going to be the next nominee for the Democrat. There's a variety of different political bets, but this is the one we're looking at is who will be the nominee for the Democrats. And up until this morning, Joe Biden was leading. He was at 36. Bernie was at, I think, 33 um, percent. He's had a big step up, and that's driven because he's leading in Iowa, he's leading in New Hampshire, and he's he seemingly has a lot of momentum uh, behind him right now. Michael Bloomberg has had a big move in the last several weeks, and Elizabeth Warren has had a huge fall. You'll see on this on this particular uh, site, they have Warren actually in fifth right now, and Andrew Yang has moved up to fourth. 
This changes, if I would have shown you this chart in November, Elizabeth Warren would have been at the top with 45%. That's how quickly things are changing. But the important thing to remember is by March 15th, roughly, um, two thirds of all the delegates will be pledged. And so by, in just a, a few weeks, we're gonna have a very clear sense of who the likely nominee is going to be for the Democrats to go against President Trump. Um, so you know on these betting markets right now, it's a 50-50 bet that Trump gets reelected uh, against any candidate. That would change probably if you had certain matchups. And it is likely that the House stays with the Democrats and that the Senate stays with the Republicans. Okay, so why does this matter for investors? Um, leaving aside politics, what, the reason that it matters is because there are clearly different policy agendas depending on who is the nominee and then who's elected eventually. And the two outliers are Sanders and Warren. And what the blue line shows you is how much they've proposed in increased spending. And the other bar shows you how much they are proposing to increase taxes to pay for that. And I'm gonna talk just a minute about why that's important about the, the spending always gets paid for. Either we borrow it or we tax it, but it always gets paid for. So how much of an increase in spending we see will drive either higher deficits or higher taxes. And it doesn't matter necessarily how they're spending it, it's just fundamentally a very different plan that either of those candidates would have for the country compared to what we have currently or what maybe a Biden or a Clinton in 2016 had proposed. So this chart, is, there's a lot of things on it, but the important there's two important pieces to it. One, we've got the yellow here for the United States. And what this shows is what percentage of our GDP is collected as taxes. And what we've got in the United States, it's just under 25%. And a client asked me recently, said, uh, are you concerned that we have trillion dollar deficits when the economy is doing well? And the answer is, of course, yes, that, that is concerning. But it's important to remember that that's a decision that the United States has made. They have decided that instead of taxing in order to pay for it, they've decided they're going to borrow. And borrowing rates are very low, so maybe it's a good economic decision. But remember, those decisions can be changed. And in the future, that decision could be changed to be that we're going to tax more and borrow less. And re recall earlier, I was talking about Germany and how cheap it was for them to borrow. And you see Germany here, they're currently taking in between 35 and 40% of GDP in order to pay for the government that they've got. Uh, they have very low deficits, but Germany could also change that decision and say, it costs us nothing to borrow today. Why don't we borrow a little bit more and why don't we tax a little bit less? And that would put a lot more money in consumers' hands and would be very stimulative for the European economy. The point being is that because a trajectory, we're on a trajectory today, for us, too much borrowing and not enough taxing in some people's mind, or Germany the other direction, that can change and it can change with an election. Talking about geopolitical risk, I mentioned that uh, the, the issue that the United States and Iran had a few weeks ago um, had a very short-term impact on oil prices, but the, the risk has always been that a Middle East confrontation is going to cause oil prices to spike, and historically, that's, that has been the case. This case shows that that maybe isn't the go-forward scenario, and the reason is because the United States is now the largest producer of oil in the world. And it's not even close um, how much larger we are than everybody else. In fact, the United States produces almost 50% of the entire oil production of OPEC. They produce 35%, we produce 18%. So as a result, when there are flare-ups in the Middle East, there's gonna be less of a reaction in prices because less of the oil supply that we're dependent upon is produced over there in a volatile region. So that's probably less of an issue going forward. And then the final point, the impact of a trade war. This graph uh, shows clear, the dotted line shows when the trade war really started. And then these graphs are the new export orders. So it's just some sense of what happened to demand once uh, these tariffs went into place. And what you see is there's clearly a downward trend. Uh, we would hope that that starts to reverse now that the global economy has become accustomed to the tariffs and hopefully there won't be any more, but additional tariffs would probably cause um, global manufacturing to, to suffer as well. So that wraps it up for the risks. Now we're gonna talk about opportunities and what we're looking at for clients in 2020. Uh, the first one is value stocks. I mentioned a, a slide on that. Value stocks are cheap and they have been for a while. A number of these opportunities, for those of you who've watched these webcasts in the past, you might think you're listening to the one from 2018 because sometimes we talk about the same things. It takes time for tr uh, trends to turn. They don't turn immediately. 
Um, value stocks is not one that we've talked about before. They've been cheap for a while, but we think we're at a point in the cycle now where value stocks could make sense, especially small value stocks. Income producing investments. The demographics of the United States are uh, such that we are creating more and more people who want stable, reliable, safe income. It's just the, the, the aging of the country. That's number one. Number two, the supply of those assets, which historically have been met significantly by municipal bonds, treasuries, and even CDs from banks, that supply of meaningful income producing safe assets is declining. If you go to the, you buy CDs, the yields are very low. Treasuries, the yields are very low. And municipals, actually, the quantity of municipal bonds is less today than it was five years ago um, because municipalities are borrowing less money. So what we have to look at is what other alternatives are available to us to generate income. And we have um, a few here that we think make sense. Uh, private credit, real estate, uh, commercial income producing real estate, we think is attractive right now. Dividend paying stocks, um, that's overlooked um, oftentimes by investors that uh, high dividend paying stocks can be a good source of income. It's tax efficient as well. And MLPs, and MLPs, I will have to tell you, we have said that for the last two years. Um, it hasn't worked out great, but we are confident that they've gotten to a point where they're cheap relative to their asset value, relative to their cash flows, and they provide very attractive um, distributions. Uh, EM equities, that's emerging market equities. This is another one that's uh, a repeat from years past. Uh, emerging markets did make money last year, not as much as the domestic market. But we think with the trade deal and we think with their improved earnings outlook, emerging market equities are a good spot to be as you're thinking about rebalancing your portfolio. And then finally, cash isn't trash. This is a play on uh, last week. There was a, a very highly thought of investor at Davos who said cash is trash. Um, and we saw that on the on the screen. We were thinking um, maybe cash is, but short duration fixed income. Um, we have a variety of different funds that we use that uh, investors can earn two to two and a half percent without taking a tremendous amount of risk. And what it allows you to do then is to be flexible if opportunities present themselves. So those would be the four big opportunities that we're looking at for 2020. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your time, and I look forward to seeing you in the new year. Have a nice day.